here is breakfast. I decided to make a big kale smoothie because I have been off my smoothie game while I was traveling. So I'm so grateful to be home and have access to my kale again. Can you see it? My kale. No. And that's my husband. Okay, sorry. And I hope you guys enjoyed the tour of the yard this morning. There's so much that's blooming. So many of my trees are blooming for the first time, like our mountain apple tree and our orange tree. Just are so good. Outside. Yeah, and a gardenia popped open too. Oh. Mmm. I like the gardenia. You can smell it in our bedroom. So today's video format is going to be a little bit different. The subject that we're going to be talking about today, kind of an update on like anxiety and emotional health and the DNRS program that I've been trying out. It's going to be, I'm predicting a long talk and I know that some of you guys just don't care. So I'm going to do the first part of this video is going to be all of the what I eat in a day. You'll see three meals sequentially back to back. And then I will see you guys to chat a little bit later on after dinner. Sound good? Good. On that note, I have several pounds of kale to wash and freeze, so I will see you guys for lunch. chickpea tuna. Oh my god. Fresh bread, veggies, a little bit of sauerkraut. I will leave the recipe in the description box below. I put just a little sunflower seeds on the top there for vitamin E purposes, don't you know? chickpea tuna sandwich. Here's mine. I'm not sure it's as pretty. This is gonna be lunch and Levi has to leave the house so maybe I'll eat his too. Better not. Going. I might not be able to fit this in my mouth. I cannot. I cannot. Oh, shit. I needed all my teeth for that one. Just dropping all over the place too. I mean, on my plate. <clears throat> okay. I gotta go. Yeah, I'm gonna finish this off, and I'll see you guys for dinner. It's gonna be good. I hope you're excited. I am. How much joy is this sparking for you right now? So that is going to be dinner. Lots of layers of gluten-free lasagna and tofu ricotta with lentils and a really yummy marinara sauce. You can go find it in the recipe box, uh, recipe video. Sorry, losing my mind as I'm thinking about this really yummy garlic bread. We just used the rest of the tofu ricotta. He added some more garlic to it and then Smells like he sprinkled on a little bit of Mrs. Dash. Hey. Bad girl, come here. And then we have a big green salad with a black tahini and lemon juice dressing. I think it'll be fantastic. I'm gonna enjoy a little glass of homebrewed kombucha. So it's very strong, very low sugar, nice and fizzy. And uh, that will be everything that I ate today. For those of you who are just in it for the what I eat in a day, 
congratulations you made it to the end and i will see you guys next time make better choices for yourself and take care bye and for those of us still working on being our best selves here we are I've been getting a lot of requests for updates on the DNRS program that I started in January to address some of the just chronic anxiety that I've felt for years and years on end. And after going through all of the external things that I had to blame for that anxiety and working on them and getting myself to a really great point in my life, I realized that that anxiety just won't stop. And after doing a fair bit of researching and learning over the last 18 or so months, I've come to understand that the anxiety won't stop because my nervous system and my limbic system and my brain is just conditioned to a certain level of anxiety. It's how my neurons are wired. It is just how I'm used to operating and getting out of that rut can be really difficult. And this year I decided to firmly and really intentionally take on that difficult task of getting myself into a better pattern neurologically. That's why I ordered the Dynamic Neural Retraining Systems program. That is what I started in January, and this is my experience with it. First of all, the DVD program is kind of expensive. It's 250 bucks, and that's a pretty big commitment. I knew when I ordered the program that the DNRS program is more geared to people with chemical sensitivities and issues with chronic fatigue syndrome or other mystery illnesses like fibromyalgia and stuff. Um, it can be used for anxiety and depression or any kind of pattern that you are stuck in neurologically, but a lot of the program was geared towards people with chemical sensitivities. You're going to hear about that a lot if you decide to do the DNRS program. I did find that I benefited from doing a lot of kind of extra reading in addition to Annie Hopper's book Wired for Healing, which is really useful for understanding why this program works. In addition to that, I really benefited from reading My Stroke of Insight by Jill Bolte Taylor, and I really enjoyed Dr. Norman Deutsch's book. This one is the physical copy that I have, The Brain That Changes Itself, and he has another one that I listened to with my Libby app for free. It was great. And so getting a better understanding of how the brain is wired, how the limbic system works, and understanding that when the limbic system gets hyper vigilant to threat, it can have massive physiological impacts on our bodies. And those impacts can have huge effects on our health, general well-being and our capacity to have successful relationships. So I really felt like I benefited from having some additional information going into the DNRS program. I'm not sure that that's necessary, but if you're an information-driven geek like me, you might want to have some extra info too. I will say about the DNRS program, I, I did the DVD program, um, it was it was purposefully very slow and repetitive and very clear, um, almost annoyingly so. Like the judgmental asshole part of my brain found a lot to complain about as far as like, oh my god, this is boring, just get to the point, I can't take it. But I do also understand that that was very much purposeful and necessary for being able to convince people of the importance of this work and going in an exact process because that is how your neurons rewire. The actual protocol for DNRS, which I will not be disclosing here because it is legally not my right to do so, did remind me very much of the process that I intuitively did when I was recovering from my eating disorders. The absolute importance of interrupting negative thought loops by verbally saying, no, stop. My brain is being hijacked by these thoughts right now and I don't have to participate. I choose another way. And then being very, very clear about the preferable path that you want to go down by verbally speaking your intentions and your goals and by visualizing a more favorable future 
and utilizing really positive emotional memories or visualizations to increase your emotional state, get yourself to kind of like a blissed out point and use those feelings to increase the rate at which new neuronal connections are made. So after you know, going through the DNRS program and doing a lot of additional research and reading. I look at the DNRS protocol and it is extremely well designed and very effective if it's, you know, actually done. I have had very favorable results in being able to manage and redirect my anxious thought loops by using the DNRS protocol and so I am very happy with the value that I got out of this investment. In addition to the DNRS program, there has been another resource that has been absolutely instrumental in me being able to understand what's going on in my brain and my body when I am exposed to something that I perceive as threatening. That resource is the polyvagal theory that was developed by Dr. Stephen Porges. He wrote this book, which is a little bit like heady and a little bit repetitive because of its format. I really enjoyed reading this book, but I don't think it's the best book on the subject. Fortunately, there is a best book on the subject, and I feel that it's this one. Currently, there aren't a ton of resources on polyvagal theory, but this one is amazing. It is geared towards therapists, but it, it's perfectly easy to understand for any layperson. Anyone who has had no medical training will have no problem reading that book and understanding the basis of polyvagal theory. Now, that book is 28 buckaroos, so it's a little bit pricey, you know, just for poor people like me, whatever. And I haven't seen it available in a library yet, and so I am so happy to report that there is a new free resource called The Polyvagal Podcast, put on by an awesome dude named Justin, can't remember his name, last name off the top of my head, but he's doing such a great job of explaining polyvagal theory and making it really accessible to everyday people like you and me, and healthcare professionals. So very basically, because I don't have like 16 hours to talk to you guys about the polyvagal theory, even though it's so cool and I would kind of like to do nothing more, but <laughs> anyway, for time's sake, very basically, polyvagal theory dictates that we have um, several nervous system states from which we can operate. The nervous system state that we, you know, want to operate from the most is called the social engagement system. This is where we feel safe, and when we feel safe, we are able to connect with other human beings. Our nervous systems are able to do this really cool thing called co-regulation, where we get close and intimate, and there is trust between uh, two or more people. Or dogs, you can do this with dogs too, but I don't want to get off onto a tangent. So in the social engagement system, we're really tuned into other human beings. Our facial muscles are really animated, we are able to tune in and hear human voices really well, we're able to pick up on social cues, um, we are really tuned in to voice poros porosity, porosity, it's pronounced prosody, so kind of the melodical up and down flowing of a happy person who's talking like this. We don't talk in monotone, okay? The social engagement system is where connection is possible, it's where healthy digestion is possible, it's where assimilation of nutrients is possible, and it's where real true rest and rejuvenation is possible. So ideally, we want to be spending time in this state, but if we are exposed to something that is threatening, our nervous system state can change. So in polyvagal theory, there's this idea called neuroception, by which your nervous system is constantly scanning the external and internal environment for signs of threat. If we perceive something that we have learned is threatening through our life experiences or what we have been taught, our bodies will 
automatically respond by switching into a different nervous system state that is a response to threat. Probably everyone watching this is familiar with the flight or fight mode, which is the mobilized sympathetic nervous system where we are capable and ready to respond really well to danger. When we switch into that mode, digestion pretty much stops. Assimilation of nutrients becomes much lower on the priority list. We are not really as able to connect and engage with other people. We don't pay as much attention to social cues. And so this state is so important to our survival, but it's not really a great place to be for a long period of time. Ideally, we want to enter into this state when there's a threat and we need to run away or fight it off. And ideally, we need to come back to the social engagement system as soon as possible after the threat has passed. Hold on, I'm getting a little washed out there. That's better. Beyond the social engagement and the flight or fight systems, there is another nervous system state that we can enter into, and that is called the shutdown state. So we would enter into the shutdown state when we perceive that we are in danger, physically or emotionally, but we feel for any reason that that danger is inescapable, that we are not able physically to escape, or our well-being, our acceptance within the group somehow depends on us staying with that threat. So when we go into the shutdown mode, our physiology completely changes. Again, digestion, assimilation of nutrients is just really put on hold. Our body temperature drops, our heart rate drops. We might feel like we're just numb or that we are dissociating from our body. And remember that with these states, there is a spectrum within each state. So within the flight or fight state, you know, I'm sure some of us have had moments where we're really startled and, you know, we jump and we're like, ah, and our heart rate is going really fast and we're sweating profusely. And I'm sure that we have had moments where we are more silently startled, where we're in a situation where we feel ashamed or internally upset, but we don't voice it, but our heart is still pounding and we're sweating and we're getting really warm and, you know, we just, we just feel like we're a little bit unstable and anxious, you know? In the shutdown mode, there's also a spectrum. So you can have people who literally just go catatonic, people who faint in response to a trauma, or you can have people who just dissociate a little bit, kind of slowly shut down, just become really quiet, uh, unable to interact. And again, within the shutdown mode, we are not in the social engagement system. And so we really struggle to pick up on social cues. Our voices do not have a pleasant porosity. Facial affect is just low and unanimated. It's really amazing how the brain and body changes as we go in and out of these states. Within polyvagal theory, there are some other mixed states, I guess is one way to call them, or blended states, whereby, you know, we could be in the social engagement system and also mobilized to do things like play and work together, or we can be in the social engagement system and shut down a little bit, and those would be the moments when we're really restful or we're experiencing intimate connections with a partner, and, hold on, is that a tank? A state in which we're really immobilizing but also socially engaged and also capable of having interactions and responding to social cues and forming trust with other people and all the like. So this is a really interesting theory. I highly, highly suggest you listen to the Polyvagal podcast or pick up a copy of this book if you are able and curious and you want to and you love geeking out like I do because the Polyvagal theory has really helped me understand that when I feel threatened and I drop into a different nervous system state, I am just mentally and physically incapable of being my best self and I have to do specific things like make sure that I'm safe, 
talk to myself, comfort myself, try to reach out for support if that's available, um, do things that are really self-soothing so that I can get myself out of this threat response, fear-based nervous system state and back into the social engagement system where I have full access to all of my neurological resources, all of my problem solving, my communication skills, and my decision-making skills. When I am not in the social engagement system, the expectations for my quality of behavior change. So I don't have to beat myself up anymore for not being my best self when I'm freaking out or when I'm shutting down. It's really helped me to understand what has gone on in, in my own relationship with Levi especially because there are moments where his behavior is so triggering to me and I identify it as a threat because I learned that it was a threat when I was a kid and so I freak out about it and he doesn't understand and then I turn into like a nightmare, a little nightmare. Polyvagal theory has also helped me navigate my relationships with my parents so much better because it's really helped me to understand why I go into fight or flight mode when I'm around my dad and you know he breathes the wrong way <laughs> or why when I am around my mom and she starts on her whole spiel my body literally shuts down and so I've been able to do a much better job in resourcing myself to be able to deal with those moments when I do slip out of the social engagement system and go down the polyvagal ladder as they say. These two books, along with all of my favorites by Brene Brown, have also helped me understand the stories that I make up about my nervous system states. So if my limbic system picks up on a threat, I will slip into a different nervous system state, either flight or fight or shut down. I will start having physiological responses to that perceived threat. And then, <laughs> wonderfully, the left hemisphere of my brain starts to make up a story to explain the way that I am physically feeling. So if I am freaking out over something, I make up a story about why. Most of the time, I blame Levi for it. <laughs> That's just the joy of being married. If I'm around other people and uncomfortable, I'll totally blame them too. But this has been really, really helpful in helping me to understand that the stories that I make up in my head about things, while they can sometimes be useful in my ability to perhaps understand myself or other people a little bit deeper. They also have the capacity to be deeply inaccurate and skewed and incomplete. And so though I respect my brain for its capacity to explain things and make logical sense out of whatever I'm going through, hazard to say it's not always accurate. It doesn't always take the full uh, situation into account. It's not always the most compassionate with other people. It doesn't always assume the best about other people and their intentions. And so it's really, really easy for me to use that story that the left hemisphere of my brain is concocting to explain the way I'm feeling as further fuel to keep myself agitated or shut down or otherwise out of the social engagement system. It's really easy for me to use those stories to blame other people for the way that I'm feeling. And though, you know, to be clear in this whole discussion, certainly there are valid threats to our physical and emotional safety, you know, avoid toxic chemicals, avoid foods that you know that you're allergic to, end emotionally or physically abusive relationships as soon as possible. But there are also a lot of threats that we perceive that are partially or fully inaccurate. Hold on one second. Hey honey, totally lost my train of thought. So anyway, understanding this whole process has helped me be a lot more realistic about the moments in which I'm feeling really anxious. Um, checking in with the story that I'm making up about it. And oftentimes I notice that that's a negative thought loop and I can use the DNRS protocol to say, stop, 
we're gonna go somewhere else with this. And I don't wanna be overly dramatic, but this has really changed my day-to-day -day experience of being alive and I'm so freaking grateful for it because like, y'all, I've been having panic attacks since I was 12 or 13 and I got okay at managing them, you know, I can kind of talk myself out of it, but it's, it's led to me getting really anxious and then the only way that I know how to do, deal with it is to kind of go into a shutdown mode and I like have to lay in bed for several hours or like, okay, well, I guess I won't get anything done today. So I'll just watch Netflix and self-soothe because I'm so worked up. And I know that if I don't self-soothe, I will fall into the addictive behaviors that plagued me as a teenager and early adult. A lot of those were eating disorder related. And though I had been able to manage those behaviors kind of by developing other behaviors, uh, other like coping mechanism behaviors, it never got to the root of the issue, which was the constant anxiety that was driving these behaviors. And again, I don't wanna be overly dramatic, but like I feel liberated from that shit, finally, for the first time in my life. And I feel like I can truly be more genuinely compassionate with myself because I understand that all the crazy shit that's going on in my head isn't because I'm crazy or broken or too fucked up to be loved, thanks mom. It's because I'm in a nervous system state in which I'm not fully resourced and there is a way to get myself out of that. And I've enjoyed the DNRS protocol for being able to kind of pop, pop me out of that. And I would wish this for every single person in the world, because I think that when we are able to take care of ourselves and resource ourselves and be compassionate with ourselves and other people as they go through these just struggles of being alive. It makes us better people and it makes our world a better place and it makes us much more able to connect with each other and love each other, truly love each other and be compassionate with one another and with all of the beings with which we share this earth. So with that, I guess this is the end of the video even though I'm about to go make dinner. So I will just say thank you guys so much for watching. It is always a joy. Until next time, make better choices for yourself. No one will do it for you and take really, really such good care. I will see you guys so soon. Bye. Are you having fun playing with your tail? Yeah, I feel like I won the lottery. No, leg day. You can't say leg day like 10 days after leg day. Uh, leg day was two days ago. Everyone knows the day after after is the worst. <laughs> Except people who don't do leg day. I remember that time when you went back to the gym. Uh huh. And you did leg day. Yeah. And you like screamed every time I touched your leg. Yeah, cause I for squat several like several days. I squat like 400 pounds. That's why. You look awfully thoughtful for someone who's eating sauerkraut. You joking? Are uh, you poking fun at me again? No, I think. You just looked like you were thinking important thoughts. I was thinking if this was good or not. Like, will I die in the morning? We've been eating it for days. You've been eating it for days. I've been staying away.